Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and uh, for joining us for the second event in this year's Chancellor's Con Colloquium Distinguished Speaker Series. We are very pleased today to have with us John Panaretos, a leading Greek educator who has been intimately involved in higher education reform movements, both in, native, in his native Greece and for the European Union. Dr. Panaretos' talk is entitled Public Universities at a Time of Austerity and Crisis, Some Lessons from Greece, a timely topic that aligns closely with the mission of the Provost Forums on the public university as a social good. So today, um, both uh, forums, this colloquium and the Provost Forum, um, are hosting really this um, event. Also, um, for that reason, but not just for that, uh, um, Provost Ralph Hexter will serve as the moderator during the Q&A session because we thought that Ralph is really the best person to uh, moderate this session and to really help us all have a very in important discussion around higher education issues. I also wanted to add that today's event serves as the kickoff for our International Education Week which begins officially on November 12th and is an annual celebration recognized by the U.S. Departments of State and Education. So this week is from November 12th through November 16th, and UC Davis will host many events that highlight international experiences across our campus, including speakers, film, food, dance, workshops, music, and more. Sounds pretty exciting. Um, this academic year, as we've done in the recent past, uh, we, have, we will serve approximately 5,000 international students and scholars on this campus, and will send about 1,500 UC Davis students and interns abroad. And of course, we would like to do more there. We would like to have more of our students who take advantage of our study abroad program. Also, we need to do more in order, in order to internationalize our campus. We must integrate international and multicultural perspectives and experiences into the learning, discovery, outreach, and engagement mission of our university. So I invite you to join us next week as we celebrate International Education Week with so many great programs and that will attract many students. It will be a great week really to have. At this point, I would like to introduce our speaker and our moderator. Um, I will start with our speaker. Dr. Panaretos will open this evening with his formal remarks, and Provost Hexter will be the moderator who will lead off a question and answer period with the audience. Um, maybe I will start with Ralph, even if I said, because <laughs> that's going to be the easiest. Uh, Ralph is a distinguished professor of classics. Of course, everybody knows him. He is our provost here at UC Davis since January 1, 2011. As an academic leader, Ralph has made it a priority to foster excellence across a full range of disciplines and to promote equal opportunity, diversity, and inclusion for students, faculty, and staff. And I would like to thank him, really, for rearranging his schedule to do, to do this today. So now I'm honored to introduce my longtime friend and our distinguished guest today, John Panaretos. John is a statistician and professor of probability and statistics at the University of Athens, University of Economics in Athens, Greece. Uh, in fact, I would say University of Economics and Business in Athens, Greece. He has been a professor there since 1991. Um, in fact, I would say yes, and John has served as Greece's Deputy Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning and Religious Affairs from October 2009 to June 2011. He has served as the education advisor to former Greek Prime Minister, George Papandreou, and as Greece's representative to the Open Government Partnership. Also, he has served as vice president of the Network of National Councils of Education of the European Union, and president of the National Council of Education and the National Council of Higher Education in Greece. He was born in Kithira, Greece, and received his first degree in mathematics from the University of Athens, and advanced degrees from the University of Sheffield and University of Bradford, both in England. With that, I would like to invite him to come forward. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chancellor, for your kind introduction and for the invitation for me to be here today and uh, to share with you some of, the, some of my thoughts on uh, public higher education. Uh, it is very exciting to be here at a great public university like uh, UC Davis. And uh, I would like to say that I'm not just excited. I'm also proud. I'm proud because I will be speaking at a university where the chancellor is a Greek woman who studied at a Greek university and has become the only Greek woman, as far as I know, to ever have led a top university in the world. So you don't have many instances today to, to have such an opportunity to be proud of. We don't have. The, the success of Linda Katehi is one of the many success stories of a system that helped many bright young people to make the best of their potential, even though their families did not possess the financial means to fully support their education. It all happened because of a major political initiative taken in 1964. The decision then was that higher education as all levels of education would be free for all those that had the ability to pursue it independently of their financial condition, is what we call in Greece Dorean Pedia. And the translation is free education, but just let me say that Dorean comes from, from the word Doro, which is gift, it's something more than just free. In the decades since then, Greece has had its ups and downs. Many things have changed. Priorities have changed. Greece is now in its worst position in the recent history. But one thing is still unchallenged. And this is the notion of Dorian Pedia, of free higher education, that is now rooted in the psyche of Greece, equally perhaps as democracy itself. One of the first acts of the dictatorship in 1967 was to completely overturn the educational reform of 1964, with one exception, and this was Dorian Pedia. Dorian Pedia, free education, is now embedded in the Greek constitution. However, higher education today in Greece, despite the successes of individual bright young people, is at a low level, as many other sectors are. But I'm not here to talk about Greece's higher education problems. What I want to try to do is to view these problems in a more general setup that will allow some lessons to be drawn for all those who care about public universities. My comments will reflect my experiences in all three capacities that influence policies in higher education. As a professor for more than 30 years, as a university administrator, and as a minister responsible for higher education and research. Higher education is a complex social structure. The key players in this social structure are the students, the faculty, the university leaders, and the policy makers. The public is indirectly involved, mainly through the students. The main issues preoccupying these key players are access, 
quality, cost, and need for social mobility, the need for social mobility. What complicates things is that any policy decision regarding any of these issues has an impact on the other three that is difficult to control. To make things harder, the different players place different emphasis on each of them. Let me just show you in a simple way how I envisage the relation of those issues and policy decisions associated with them. We have the four aims, cost, access, quality, and social mobility, and the policy decision. This, this, the, the shape can take different forms depending on the social conditions in different countries and at different times. The closer one edge is to another, the easier it is to satisfy both corresponding ideals simultaneously. The farther away one edge is from another, the harder it becomes to optimize both, and the more extreme and painful the trade-off becomes. The, the, the shape, this shape and this situation, can take dramatic changes at the period of an economic crisis. Of course, in an ideal world, all points will concentrate at one, at one point. In Greece, in the 1960s, when the policy decision was made to offer free education for all, access was low. We had only two universities. This made it possible to maintain quality. As years passed, especially after 1996, Greece followed the international trend to mass higher education that has since become universal higher education. This was politically attractive, but had a negative effect on quality. Quality dropped. Even worse, social mobility declined. Greece has now the second highest unemployment rate of graduates in the European Union. Social mobility is a strategic target. Free higher education and access are tools to achieve social mobility. So, the strategic target of the policy of free higher education was compromised while the tools for achieving it remained in place. To justify a free higher education and to maintain access, all education policies were formulated with one aim, to serve equity and not equal opportunity. This has led to total uniformity, to the detriment of excellence. Uniformity has gone to extremes, even at the expense of talent. To give you just an example, in the name of uniformity, a bright student that had completed his four-year degree in three years could not graduate by law until four years elapsed. Clearly, the policy has failed. And it is not easy to change the situation because of the trade-offs and especially because of the financial crisis. Now, the creditors of Greece are asking for painful decisions. They want the clo closing down of departments and of universities. Remember, I, I said that when Dorian Pedia was introduced, free education in 64, we had two universities. Now we have 40 higher education institutions. So you understand what the problem is when the taxpayer has to cover all the expenses for all these institutions. And, is, and uh, as if the above were not enough, the public is very negative today towards universities and their leadership, believing that they are not serving their mission. 
and that they live in their own ivory tower. There are many accusations of lack of accountability and transparency in universities. And when you lose public support, you are in danger of also losing the support of the policymakers. Before I make some remarks from the lessons from Greece, let me just point out some similar similarities and differences that I see between Greece and California. Both in Greece and California, we cherish public higher education. We also promote social mobility. And of course, Greece and California are going through a serious financial crisis. But probably this is as much as Greece and California share as far as higher education is concerned. The, difference, the differences are important, and I think these differences make California and the public university system in California much more viable and less susceptible to difficulties that we are facing in Greece. In Greece, like in many European countries, we have a centrally controlled system, while here decisions are taken at the university level with accountability, which is important. In Greece, as in most European countries, we are controlling input, while here you are evaluating output. Salaries in Greece of all personnel are paid by the state. Also, the student numbers are decided by the state. And importantly, the emphasis in Greece is on equity and access, while here in California is on equal opportunity and excellence. And things become even more difficult when uh, there are other policy decisions that are the result of other priorities. For example, in, here in California, in the United States, and in Greece, uh, the health care has taken priority. And when you have a, such a, a development, then the funding for higher education, for public higher education, uh, becomes less. Having said all that, let me talk about some of the lessons that uh, can be drawn from the experiences uh, in Greece. I think we should not compromise on excellence. Even though there will be pressures to narrow down the number of universities pursuing excellence, it is the quality of education which counts, not just the numbers. Always stress the difference between equality and equal opportunity. Don't succumb to uniformity in the name of equality. Do whatever you can to have the public at your side. It is hard, but it is necessary. If you manage it, you improve your chances to have the policy makers on your side. To do this, Choose carefully your friends and decide who are those that you don't mind to displease. Promote accountability and transparency to convince the public that their, tax, their, their taxes are well spent. Emphasize that social benefits from higher education and social mobility because of higher education are two different ideals. All universities, public and private, contribute to social benefits. For social mobility, it is the public universities that the state can count on. Motivate and assist public universities to increase access for enhancing social mobility and not for collecting more tuition fees. Yeah. 
Remember that access has an immediate impact for policymakers. Pursue it innovatively. Perhaps work closer with community colleges? As academics, don't only pursue scientific excellence at good teaching. Understand the more general societal settings and constraints and explain why what you are doing is important. Universities are the places with the highest concentration of experts, professors. However, do not hesitate to admit mistakes. The public appreciate it. Better diversify at a high standard than uniformize at a low standard. And last but not least, always remember that your students are your asset, but also they are uneasy and impatient partners. Finally, a more general lesson. A financial crisis is usually followed by a social crisis. Social mobility is important because it improves social cohesion. In my remarks, I have not dealt with crucial issues such, th such as the influence of distance learning, the importance or not of location, the use of technology, completion rates, etc. I feel that these are important, but only side issues as compared to the main ones that I mentioned. Thank you for listening. Maybe you should thank you there. Thank you, Dr. Panaretos, and let me also say thank you to the Chancellor for letting us combine our two series for, for this event. Um, the, the series that we've established, the, the Provost Forums on the Public University and the Social Good, um, it was just too wonderful to have this opportunity of the guest in the, in the Chancellor's Colloquium, because you've been speaking very much about that, and uh, as we know from our our series, um, this issue that's very much on our mind about how we fund our universities, how we get society at large to appreciate investment in universities is not restricted to the United States. It's a problem in every, it's a challenge in every country and the lessons that you've shared with us are ones we'll want to, to think about. So thank you all for coming. And let me begin by asking you to, um, to, to speculate, um, you've talked about in your slides how you can balance these different goods of access, cost, quality, social mobility. I think that it's interesting that when we're speaking, we tend not to list social mobility explicitly as a good, but I think that it's a mistake not to do that. My, my question is, can you give us some advice here for California about how we could optimize that as you understand our situation, how you think that we could make sure that we're uh, hitting on all four cylinders? Well, uh, I wish I could. I think this is not, uh, this is a question that doesn't have an easy answer. And uh, uh, studying the situation in different countries where they have tried to improve social mobility, I, I can see that the approach they followed was not successful. For example, I can, I can uh, talk about Ireland. In Ireland, they abolished tuition fees in 1994 or 95. And then they introduced tuition fees a few years ago. Now, uh, they have found out in analyzing the, 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 their data that the abolition of tuition fees did not uh, helped in advancing social mobility. Uh, I think we have a similar, uh, a similar experience in Sweden where there is a study by a professor here, Davis, a professor uh, from economics, I think his name is Evans, 
if, I'm, if I remember correctly, uh, he has showed that, again, uh, I mean, uh, Sweden is a country that has as a main um, ideal social mobility. And he has also shown that uh, in, in Sweden they didn't manage to, they didn't achieve that. So uh, I think one perhaps way of achieving that is to, uh, uh, to place emphasis on the, on the number of students, on, on the students that you get with a lower social background and to be able to present to the public the value added through your programs. To be honest with you, having been here half a day, I think that what you are doing in Davis is tremendous. I, I'm impressed, and I have been to many places. I, I can tell you that. And Link Dakatehi knows that I'm not very easy in, in uh, making compliments. So uh, uh, I think that probably Davis, in a few years' time, may be a leading university, not only in numbers like research money that you get, but in adapting to new social settings and to new social needs. You um, spoke about also your role as a minister of research along with higher education. Of course, for a university like UC Davis, a leading research university, um, research is completely uh, part of our mission, our goal, and uh, sometimes, some of the public um, sometimes imagines that there is a tension between our role as a teaching institution and the research that we do, the role of professors as teachers and professors as researchers. I wonder from the Greek perspective or your experience in European and other universities, how you would address those concerns that some members of the public have. Well, I, the, one thing that I can say is that for all the information that uh, have come to my attention during my uh, term as a minister, and uh, during the, the meetings of ministers of education and research, ministers of research, because we had different meetings as ministers of education and different meetings as ministers of research, uh, it, it, is, it is proven that good universities, good research universities, cannot be good unless they are good in teaching, and good teaching universities cannot be good unless they are good in research. So research and teaching, contrary to what some people believe, go hand in hand. You mentioned as one of the things that you didn't talk about was online education. I very much like to hear your comments on that and how that is beginning, if it is, beginning to emerge on the European and particularly Greek horizon. Well, we have the traditional uh, open universities and we have open universities in most European countries, but I think that things are changing and uh, I would probably go as far as to say that I have a feeling that the United States may become the next empire because of the distance learning and the innovation there. I, I see the, the initiatives with, with Coursera and the, the, the initiative with MIT and the number of bright young people all over the world who attend these courses. So again, I'm sorry to say as a European, the US is going to have an advantage that it will take a long time for Europe to follow. Uh, uh, and the advantage will have different repercussions and implications that it will require much more time to, to discuss. <clears throat> you've, you've talked in, in that response and, and I know elsewhere we've talked a little bit about the way Europe is looking to the United States, and particularly U.S. higher education, as a, as a model in some ways. I'm wondering um, what are some of the aspects of American higher education that is so attractive to European educators? And, and maybe, if it's not too technical, um, you, you might refer to the Bologna process um, in, in Europe. And I, the audience might want a little explanation about that. Okay, uh, I will start with the Bologna process. I think the Bologna, pro uh, well, the Bologna process is a policy taken at the European Union level where students 
from one university and from one country are encouraged to go to, 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 to other places, but most importantly, of using a, a, a Europe-wide uh, higher education area where degrees and qualifications obtained in one country will be recognized in another country. That has taken about 10 years to, 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 to be completed. There, in different countries, there were different reactions. Some countries were positive, some others were not positive. Students reacted in some countries, uh, Germany, Greece, uh, Spain. Uh, but it is, it is useful to have a tool where you know that if you, if you are a, a, a union like the EU is trying to be, it is, it is important that you can transfer uh, uh, qualifications and knowledge from one place to the other. Now, as far as uh, uh, Europe and I think Asia, uh, looking into the United States for, for uh, examples and, uh, and uh, good practices, I would say that in some places we have seen that things work in the United States. And for some reason, they don't work well. I mean, if you look at the, at the rankings, university rankings, I think in one of them, 17 out of the 20 top universities are from the US, and 53 out of 100, which is even more important. Uh, and we look in research what you do, the fact that you you, you, you introduced the concept of interdisciplinary research, uh, the fact that you tried to, to narrow down um, bureaucracy in submitting research proposals uh, and making the, pros the proposals easier to, to submit. Um, other, other, other issues that the US has tried and they are successful. But my feeling is that we are slow in, in, in adapting these changes. And if I, if, I can, if I can mention one example, one experience that I had as a minister of research, say, it was realized in Europe that it is much easier and much less expensive to get a patent in the United States than in Europe. I think it costs about 10 times as much in Europe to get a patent. So we met as ministers of research to discuss the changes necessary to make Europe, Europe competitive. Well, we met four times within a year in different places, and we spent two to three hours each time, probably more, discussing it. And at the time I left, I, st I stopped being minister. We had not resolved the issue, because the issues were, are we going to have two or three languages or more? Should all languages be, be there? translated, I mean, all, all patterns should be translated, should be an automatic translation, electronic translation, how that would be accurate. And then the U.S. is moving forward, faster and faster. Well, I wish it were the case that we never had unproductive meetings, but, um, <laughs> you know, when you're talking about research and patents, um, a lot of our work at universities involves um, working with industry and with, with private business. And, and also there's the matter, which I think is much um, more broadly established, even for public universities now in the US, private philanthropy. And this brings me to a, a word that we've heard a lot of, um, privatization. And I, I know from some of my travels that it's not only a word being discussed in the US. So um, again, you've been talking about the strong public university tradition in, in Greece. My understanding is it's actually illegal to have a private university. And of course, it's in the Constitution that you have free education. I'm wondering what comments you have on what you see as the privatization or this mixed mode of university that we have here in the US. Well, first of all, I don't like the fact, I don't like any, uh, anything to be uh, uh, forbidden. I mean, to forbid private universities by the Constitution. 
That means that you, you, you are not prepared to compete with somebody. Uh, I think uh, public universities, uh, public higher education is very important. And the state and the people will support public higher education. But to not to allow any other activity so that you have the monopoly and you are happy with what you are doing, no matter whether what you're doing is good or not, I think that's wrong. Secondly, I think that we've managed, probably in the US too, but in Greece especially and in Europe, this word privatiza privatization has gone a very negative connotation. And it is used by those that do not want to see change so that they don't allow change to happen. You have, I mean, uh, the, the things that come under the umbrella of what is called privatization, they are not supporting, say, uh, 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 the idea of private versus public. They give a public university the opportunity to compete and to be successful. So, well, philanthropy, philanthropy is a Greek word, thousands of years now, and, and, and some of the most important things in Greek education ha have occurred because of philanthropists, and we are proud of those. So, I would say, if I can, if I can, if I can make a comment, don't be afraid of words, try to do what is best for the university, and if you are successful in what you're doing, then the connotation that those that do not like change uh, uh, doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, um, I th I'm thinking the Athenians have been <laughs> resisting the, the rich like Philip of Macedon for a very long time. But that leads me to one last question that I want to ask before turning this open to, to everyone, which is, of course, as the Chancellor mentioned, I'm a professor of classics and comparative literature. So I'm curious as to the role of a, a whole range of disciplines, particularly social sciences and humanities and arts in the, um, the, the, the Greek universities and also, um, I also know this is something that is being looked at in other countries. We have here a long tradition of, of wanting our undergraduate students to have exposure to a broad range of topics, including all of the humanities, the, the liberal arts. I'm wondering what the perspective is on, on those topics and, and liberal arts in, in the Greek universities. Well, uh, I think the, the, the approach that you have is a very good one. I think you need today scientists, people that, that uh, study in the university to have a broad view, not just a, 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 a narrow-minded view of the field that they want to study. Unfortunately, and this is another, another one of the problems of uniformity that I mentioned before, unfortunately, again, in Greece, uh, uh, probably in some other European countries, but in Greece uh, mainly, we are very narrow in, 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 in our studies. So a, a, a student who graduates may be very good, say, in physics or in mathematics or in, uh, in biology, but he doesn't have that broad view uh, 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 that you mentioned that you, you, you find in the, in the US, which is important. And to give you one, one example, my son, wanted to study to combine mathematics and philosophy. And in Greece, he couldn't do that. Can you imagine that? In Greece, out of all places, not to be able to study mathematics and philosophy at the same time. Plato would have failed. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm sure there are questions out here. We have a microphone circulating. Uh, I see Carrie over here. Andrew, over here. Or I guess we have a microphone. Uh, Professor Panardos. Is it on? Professor Panardos, uh, thank you so much for uh, visiting our campus and thank you for your uh, remarks. 
My question uh, uh, relates to Dorian Pedia, um, and I respect and I appreciate uh, free education, and I understand, of course, it is part of the Constitution, not only in Greece, but from what I understand, in many other European countries. Uh, many uh, members of the American higher education system uh, would argue that um, maybe the two terms that make this expression Dorian Bedia may be incompatible with each other. They may question that the, the, the lack of uh, having skin in the game, uh, if you would, that maybe the term Dorian Bedia may be an oxymoron. Um, but what, are your, what are your views on that? Well, now I have to answer you as a politician and not as a professor. <laughs> Have we made the best out of what Dorian Pedia is? I don't think we have. Would things be different if we didn't have Dorian Pedia, if uh, 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 students participated to a certain extent to the cost of their education? I don't know that. But I, I have a feeling that there are so many issues that we can confront and resolve without getting into the argument of whether students should also participate in, in the cost of higher education. Because I feel that if we solve all the other issues in, in an appropriate way, uh, uh, we can probably still, we can probably keep this unique characteristic of the Greek higher education system. But what I don't like is to use the, uh, uh, the idea of free, of free higher education, of Dorian Pedia, in order not to make the changes necessary. I mean, excellence and, uh, and competition and the, the, the seeking the talent is so important. That has nothing to do with Dorian Pedia. We have to do that. We have talent. You, you find people here in Davis, you find people at Berkeley, Harvard, UCLA, uh, you name it. These are young people who studied in Greece. They were very good. But I... I have a suspicion that they are good despite the system and not because of the system. Please. Let's wait to the mic if you don't mind. Oh, okay. Dr. Penaritis, thank you very much for being here. <clears throat> On a, uh, different topics, I'd like to ask you, do you see universities and specifically Greek universities having a more direct role in uh, job creations, uh, in uh, a, a more impact uh, in terms of working with the, uh, uh, with the uh, government and or also preparing um, students for uh, the right jobs. Thank you. Well, I don't think that we have much of that. And one of the reasons is that universities do not have in incentives for uh, taking this as a challenge in their mission. Uh, universities and university professors somehow feel that their responsibilities uh, start and end with educating the young people. And, and there is also, there is also some, some resistance to more cooperation between universities and, and business, uh, which is not explainable easily, but uh, it's political, political, mostly political. And uh, how we can, the, the, the interesting thing for somebody in, 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 in politics is to see how to change that how to make universities have incentives for preparing their, 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 their students, not just as scientists, but preparing to, to be able to, 
to contribute to society and, and, and uh, to find uh, uh, jobs. And uh, I think the only thing I can say is that we have to work harder on that. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't achieved what we should have achieved. Looking for some other, ah, more. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Panaretos, for coming to Davis to visit us and uh, give us some good ideas and comparisons. I think that the word mm, uh, philanthropy comes from Greek, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I know that there are wealthy, wealthy families in Greece. I think Mrs. Kennedy joined one of those families, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I wonder if there is a role of, of philanthropy to the universities of Greece from, from people like uh, uh, those. Thank you. Well, there should be, but there isn't, <laughs> yet. Uh, uh, as part of the changes in the, uh, in the laws uh, regarding higher education, we created, say, the, 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 the setup, the legal setup, because in a, central, in a centrally controlled educational system, eh, there should be a law for everything. So we created the, the, the setup for, for, for people to, to be able to contribute to education and to higher education and to education in general. Will that happen? Well, I think, again, we have to work both at the university level and at the political level. For a philanthropist to give her or his or her money, he has to be, to be sure that the money is used in, in, in the best possible way and have an impact on the reason why they are given. We haven't yet convinced the world community that whenever money becomes available, the use of this money is the best one. So, uh, uh, as I said, we have to work harder. We have to, to improve. And I'm sure that people, not only in Greece, but people from outside Greece, people of Greek descent, but also people who are not Greek, they, they want to help Greece. They want to help Greece, but they want to help Greece to improve, not just give some money to, 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 to a charity or to a university or to a school. Makes me think of the terms you recommended in that list, accountability and transparency. You know, if I might insert a question here, um, maybe you, in philanthropy, which is one of the sources here, leads me to, to wonder if you would talk about both how Greek higher education is funded now and also perhaps talk about that in the context of the, of the current um, austerity measures and the, the particular situation of, of the economy in Europe and in, in Greece. Yes. Well, uh, uh, most of the funding for, for Greek higher education comes from the taxpayer, from, from the government. And I mean the ones who pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> yes, the, one, the ones who pay taxes. And, and there is, there is a, a certain uh, proportion a certain part that comes from, from research money, uh, usually from outside Greece, usually from, from the EU. And Greek researchers have proven that they are good in, in, in uh, 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 submitting good proposals and getting research money. So some of this money now is used to, to finance uh, activities of the universities that are necessary. But I'm a practical person. And I suppose everybody in this room understands that when you have cuts, 10, 15, 20% cuts in budgets, in salaries, you cannot maintain 40 higher education institutions and expect them to do well 
or to do at least as well as they did, whatever that well was. Uh, so there are, in, in, my, in my opinion, there are hard decisions that have to be taken. And uh, I, I believe that if the creditors of Greece insisted more from the beginning on structural changes instead of insisting on a, a financial measures with immediate effect, cutting salaries, cutting um, uh, pensions, uh, Greece would find its way to recovery much sooner. I think Greeks, you know, Greeks work hard. I mean, okay, you have an example here. Uh, uh, and there are other examples here. I, 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 I talk to some people in the morning. Uh, uh, they need the right, the right environment, and they need to have the framework to, to achieve and to, uh, to, to, to use the best of their potential. Right, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, and I, I, I apologize, I don't want to be accused of inhospitality or uh, the assault on philoxenia of, <laughs> of, of, uh, of, of aligning the Greeks, but I think that I'm um, thinking about your comments also about philanthropy is clearly all taxpayers too need to be confident that the institutions are using resources wisely um, so that accountability and transparency is, is, is necessary for building all of those institutions. Um, questions, please. Uh, we've got to, please wait until the um, microphone comes right there. Uh, can I just make one comment, please? Please, b b before your question. There are some misconceptions about the Greeks, that the Greeks are lazy. I, I, I would put a slide on uh, when you complete your questions uh, that will show you with hard facts that these are misconceptions. That was just in reply to, to, to your comments about what is probably wrong in Greece or with Greeks. And, and I want you to know that, that I got a hint from our visitor that it would be okay to get into that topic. <laughs> Please. Because you, have, because you have a monopoly on admissions, are you admitting fewer percentage-wise students to the university level than, say, in the United States where it's open and we may be over educating people, but we have more. In other words, if a student is a grind and gets an A plus, you're going to take them. But a B plus student may not make your qualifications because you have limited slots. And he may be the creative one and is thinking out of the box. So I wonder if you're limiting too tightly the people you do take into the university. Well, thanks for the question. Because the, uh, here is, there is another uh, uh, strange thing that's happening in Greece. In Greece, we offer more university places that we have candidates competing for. If I show you the numbers, uh, I mean, when we have set up 40 higher education institutions. There, there are years that some of the places available are not filled. And uh, I mentioned the compromise of quality. One minister a few years ago tried to check. We have a national entrance exam system. Everybody who wants to go to the university has to take this national entrance exam. And according to the performance, they are placed in, 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 in different departments, in different universities. You know, the top ones go to the medical school. Some others go to technical schools and so on and so forth. So this minister said, we have very low quality university students. Some of them, they get to the university, say, uh, with a score of 4 out of 20 or 3 out of 20. So what she did, she said, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to, uh, uh, she introduced a law that you couldn't get a place in higher education unless you scored at least 10 out of 20. What happened then? I think in those years, we had about 15 to 20,000 empty spaces in the universities. We had, we had whole departments where the faculty didn't have anything to do. So we were paying. This is, this is strange. We were paying for, 
for the faculty, paying for the building, paying for, for the administration, and we kept people out because they were not very good. And okay, how can you say, as you rightly pointed out, that these people could not perform well? But this brings another issue which I didn't talk about so far here. I liked what president, the ex-president and the next president of the United States said some time ago, that we need mass higher education. We don't need mass university education. You are, you are very lucky to have here the community college system. You are very lucky. And not just have the community college system, because there are other countries like Switzerland or I think Austria and Germany that they have technical education, post-secondary, uh, good technical education. But you are lucky because you can have movement in your system. People can go to, to, to community colleges, and if they are good, they can go to universities. If they can stay with the, the qualifications they get, they, and they can, go to, uh, they can go out and get a job. So this is very important, the, the, this, the, this, this movement, this, the, 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 the possibility. And this contributes also to social mobility much more than having more university places available, I think. It's one of the things that the Chancellor is very, very um, interested in and, and emphasizes here is the importance of international experience. Um, is study abroad something that Greek students um, are involved in? Do they seek that? And I might also add, how international are Greek universities? Well, Greek students more and more realize that getting an international experience is, is useful. And that has been proven also uh, uh, by the, the, the way that they, get, they go into the job market. Those who have an international experience, they do much better. Now, again, you also raised the, the question about universities. Do they have the incentive for being international? Incentive is a word that is missing. And, 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 and what is associated with incentives? So I wish that, that Greek universities were more international, not just for bringing more students from different countries. You know that uh, internationalization in higher education is a big business now. Everybody's after international students. Uh, in Asia, in Australia, the United States, uh, the UK. But I'm not talking about just uh, uh, money. I'm talking about the importance of being exposed to other cultures, seeing what's happening there, and also explain what is happening in your country. So I, I wish we had more internationalization. I, I think it's very important for you here in Davis that you, you promote that. And I'm sure you will see results of that uh, very soon. Do I see some other questions? Uh, yes. Professor Panardos, thank you for being here with us. Um, one question of mine, there is a lot of discussions about how to make education people in order to make people more competitive. But I feel there is not much discussion about how to keep those people competitive. So I want to know your sentiment about lifelong learning programs and whether the state should more actively pursue this kind of programs and the role that the universities can play on this. I think life, lifelong learning is one of the most important aspects uh, uh, in education and uh, uh, for some reason universities do not seem to be very eager to pursue I don't know why um, in Europe where s things are done centrally there is emphasis in words and in declarations for supporting uh, continuing education Again, 
I think you need incentives. Incentives not just for those who are the recipients uh, as, uh, of, of continuing education, but incentives of those who offer continuing education. And uh, open universities do that, but I think it's, that's not sufficient. And I also think that it doesn't have to be a formalized degree. I wouldn't be surprised if a few de uh, years down the road, especially with distance learning, we see agencies outside the universities. Universities can offer a degree, so, so that certifies that you, you are an expert on something. We may see agencies that certify that you have certain qualifications because you did, you studied here, you did some uh, distance learning from there, you had some continuing education at a, at, at, a, at a different institution. So I believe that universities should pursue different avenues that the traditional professor on the podium and teachers in, in, in the hall. And the students in the hall, sorry, teachers. They, they know better. Please. With the EU and all of the problems, it, it appears like um, there's going to be a fiscal cliff like we may be facing, but it's coming to a head, particularly in Greece, as if I read the papers correct, and other countries. Is there the will, and I hate to get into politics, but is there a will for massive reforms in such things like education? It sounds like you have a huge growth in higher education which means must mean a huge cost increase, yet the word free comes out, and it isn't free. But is, do you think countries like Greece, Spain, have the political will, maybe at a gun at their head, to make some very tough, critical decisions? You want an honest answer? I don't think they have. I don't think we have. And, uh, How, how things will change unless we understand and we realize that we have to make these painful decisions that, uh, that you mentioned. Uh, we may find ourselves in a situation where what we do is irrelevant when we decide to do something. And uh, at the European level, there are some efforts, but what I don't like in Europe, if I may say that, is the bureaucratic approach. You know, we set targets and we say, by 2040, we want to have 40, by 2020, we want to have 40% um, of young people with a university degree. And then if you see at the target set earlier, 2000, 2010, uh, the Lisbon Treaty, you see that we haven't achieved those. And then we have the, perhaps I'm, I'm going to, I, I will stop here because I'm too, too critical about uh, policies in Europe, but I, I will say it. You, you have the commissioner, you have the commission, commissioner uh, Barroso saying, we want to set up the MIT of Europe. Well, you have very good institutions in Europe. You have uh, Imperial College, you have ETH in Zurich, you have EPFL, you have uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in France. Well, try to allow them to, to perform better and don't try to use another institution, but this is a typical, this is a typical European approach. When something, when there is something we don't like, we say, let's Create something. Example, for example, we don't like what the uh, uh, rating agencies are doing. They're all based in the US. And we say that what they're doing is not good, they, they are not fair, and so on and so on. What did they say? What did the, the leadership said? We will set up a European rating agency by the Commission. Okay, you can do that, but who is going to, to listen to it? <laughs> then, we also, we didn't like the rankings. 
And when we realize that there are no many European universities in, 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 in the international rankings, different rankings. Okay, you can, there are many critical points one can make about the rankings. But what do we say? We set up a new structure for making a European ranking system. We started in 2010, and this is still in progress. Sometime we will come up with a ranking. Will that have any relevance? I don't know. Since you mentioned politics, I, I'm wondering if I could ask you um, to comment on what I understand from my perspective as a relatively new development um, and, and somewhat concerning the New Dawn movement, the, the party that seems to be very virulently anti-immigrant. I know this is a little bit away from education, but since we have a, um, yeah. a, a, a figure from the Greek political world, I'd very much like to hear your perspective. Well, the, uh, uh, this extreme right-wing party did not exist before the last elections. And uh, one has to, 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 to try to explain what happened in the meantime. Remember what I said before, that a, a financial crisis uh, leads to, to, to social crisis. And the way that the political parties are trying to, uh, to face the challenge from the extreme right I think is not the best one. Some people say, let's make it illegal, again. The idea of not liking something and making it illegal doesn't offer anything. I think it's more attention, is, and they, they know very well how to play the media game. They are very good in that. But the way to, 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 to confront the problem is to do precisely what we should do in order for them to be relevant. So it is the responsibility of the state. I mean, if, if, if people feel that they are not safe in their neighborhood because the police doesn't do it doing its job, and these people come there and say, we will protect you. Well, people, poor people would say, okay, I, I accept that. So, instead of saying big words, we should make our police work better. We should make our educational system better. We should try to have the immigrants uh, uh, to be legal there in Greece, to decide how we, we want to approach this problem, because it is, there is a problem, and we cannot deny that there is a problem. But by no face, but without facing the problem, if, if we don't face the problem, we allow them to become uh, more popular. And Greeks, I mean, it's, it's impossible. Greeks cannot support a fascist party. It's impossible. This, this has nothing to do with Greeks. So we should work. We should work hard, but not in a positive way. So we don't give them the opportunity to, uh, to do things that social structures are responsible for. Uh, Carolyn. Andrew. Uh, now well, we've got a, uh, a mic coming right there. I spent last year in uh, Spain. And I, over the course of the year as I was there, in language classes that I was taking, I noticed the influx of Greek students. And so by you know, maybe the last half of last year, there were as many Greek students in the classes to learn Spanish, younger students as there were Russian students, for example. And I, I wonder, and, and for many of them, when I talked with them, their motivation was to get their Spanish language skills up enough that they could attend university. Um, many of them, now I'm listening to you, I, I understand, had free university at home, but it was precisely because of social mobility and the desire to have jobs. 
So I'm wondering, can you kind of sketch out right now how many Greek students have left Greece and are in other parts of the EU pursuing educations or in the US and what that, if anything, might mean for the future of education reform in Greece as I assume many of them will return home. Well, uh, we have young Greeks that have been going abroad to study before the, the financial crisis. And the reason is that they want to study uh, um, in, in areas where there are no enough university places in Greece. For example, they want to study medicine, they want to study law, uh, 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 they want to study engineering. And so the reason why they go abroad is that they cannot get the places. They can get places, but not the places that they feel it would be better for them. So this is, this is not associated directly with the financial crisis. The, the thing that it is associated with the financial crisis uh, is that young people who complete their studies in Greece and they are capable, they seek jobs abroad. And you cannot stop that. You cannot stop that. Uh, unless we change the, the climate in Greece and there are more jobs created and, and, and people can find a job there, we are going to, to lose young people. Martin. In the meantime, I will prepare this. OK. This. So, so one is students. But how about the professors? I would guess that as, as this um, salary decreases, that the professors are going, your best professors will be stripped out of your universities. Is that happening? Or do you expect it to happen? And how will you deal with it? Well, it is happening. S some of them, some of the, some of the, best pro the best professors that you say, I mean, salaries have already decreased for professors uh, by 17%, I think. And with the latest memorandum of understanding that is going through parliament today and tomorrow, there's going to be further cuts in, in, in salaries. It's not only salaries. It is also the, the facilities and the the possibilities for them to, 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 to do what they, they want to do, what they, they, they are capable of doing. So I expect uh, that there would be a problem. And they have similar problems in, 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 in Portugal and in Spain. But in Portugal and in Spain, they are lucky, the professors, not the country, they are lucky because they have uh, South America where they speak Portuguese or Spanish and they find jobs easier. So. Uh, uh, I think in that competition, which is an unhealthy competi competition, people live in their country to go to another place, uh, uh, Portugal and Spain uh, uh, are in, 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 have an advantage. What I, what I wanted to do, if, uh, uh, if you don't mind, is to find a slide uh, that... Uh, No, that's the first misconception that I mentioned, that Greeks are lazy. So these are data that uh, are compiled by the, the OECD, and they are very recent data. So you can see from there that Greeks work the most hours per year of all European countries. And they, I think, fourth or fifth, I think Mexico is first, then uh, Korea and Chile and Greece. This is one misconception. And then, there is a talk about structural reforms. Greece is first in structural reforms in the period from 2008-9 to 2010-11. Of course, you can say that we were so much behind that there was so much structural reforms we should do. OK, well, of course, that's true. And the third one, again, from the OECD, Greece is amongst the 
10 uh, economies with the largest improvement in ease of doing business. Again, <laughs> it was, the situation was so bad that there was so much room for improvement. But I think we are improving. So uh, I think Greeks are trying to correct the situation. Greeks realize that the country has problems. And I don't think that in any other country people would be willing or tolerant to the, to the sacrifices that the Greek people have been asked to make. So I wonder if I might ask one last question before we, we turn to our uh, reception, and that is, if you could imagine some opportunities for Greek universities and UC Davis to collaborate and possibly create programs together, what would that be? The reason why it takes me some time to, to reply to your question is that although I would be more than thrilled having places like UC Davis collaborate with institutions in Greece, I would like to be able to say that the conditions are right for places like Davis to, to collaborate with partners in Greece. And I think we need to work a little bit harder in Greece to, to, to come to that point. But having said that, having said that, the approach that Davis has, is, is having towards higher education, the way it approaches different research, hard research questions, would be, be very beneficial to Greek universities, to Greek prof professors, and to, 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 to Greek students. So uh, uh, I would be more than happy and welcome to, to see UC Davis uh, trying to, uh, uh, or not trying, being willing to, to collaborate with Greece. And I'm sure that as far as Greece is concerned, there, is, there will be only benefits. Well, thank you very much, and um, let's thank Dr. Before, ah. before, before we, we leave, can I make one last Please, comment? Please, of course. I, I talked about California and Greece, and there are two historic incidents that I would like to, to mention this evening. Uh, in the 60s, there was a professor at UC Berkeley, Department of Economics, Andreas Papandreou. He was, he was the chairman of the department. In fact, he made the department a very good department. Then he returned to Greece. And he tried to create a new university. Remember I said that there were two universities in 64? A third university, University of Patras, based on the model, on the California model. He didn't succeed because the resistance to change was very, very hard. Now, in 2010, 50 years later, an international committee was formed with world-known leaders in higher education from the States, from Europe, from Asia, from Australia, to advise the Greek government on higher education reforms. And this group of these eminent leaders was led by Chancellor Katehi. I hope and I wish that their suggestions this time are luckier than the ones that Papandreou tried 50 years ago. Thank you. Well, I, I can't resist saying that it's 
almost certain because you've chosen to receive advice from UC Davis and not UC Berkeley. <laughs> um, <laughs> in any event, but before inviting you all to the reception in the lobby, I want to note that uh, the next speaker in the Chancellor's Colloquium Series, Dr. Kumar Patel, will be here uh, on Tuesday, December 4th, Dr. Kumar is, Patel is a professor of physics with a joint appointment in electrical engineering at UCLA, former vice chancellor for research at UCLA, and also the inventor of the carbon dioxide laser. And uh, that will be, as I said, on December 4th at 4 p.m. So thank you very much. Thanks again to our speaker. And please join us for a reception in the lobby. Thank you. Very